Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. We're beginning our unit on repeated games, and this is an important one. A lot of interactions don't just take place once. Rather, they recur with the same people over and over again. This unit is going to address how strategies can evolve under those circumstances. And we're beginning with a repeated prisoner's dilemma because that's a popular one. To motivate this further, let's think about some of the things we already know about the prisoner's dilemma. We know that in a one-shot prisoner's dilemma, the only outcome we can get in that is mutual defection. Defection strictly dominates cooperation for each player, so as a result, the unique Nash equilibrium of the game is for both players to defect. If we're thinking about this as a repeated game, we already know something about a repeated prisoner's dilemma. You might recall from our unit on extensive form games that in repeated games, games with stages, playing a Nash equilibrium in each stage, in each period, is a subgame perfect equilibrium. So if we were to play a prisoner's dilemma over and over and over again, we know from this theorem that it is an equilibrium for both players to defect in each period. But we also know that for some extensive form games, cooperation is possible even if cooperation is not possible in the stage game. And so if you combine all of this together, we have some lingering questions here. First, is it possible to play cooperation contingent strategies in a repeated prisoner's dilemma? That is, can we play a strategy that takes the form of, hey, I'm going to cooperate for now, and please be nice to me, and if you're nice to me, I'm going to cooperate later for you to reward you for that cooperative behavior that you gave me. But if you do something nasty to me, I'm going to defect on you. This is important because many real-world interactions look like a prisoner's dilemma, and it says something pretty nice if we can get ourselves out of these bad situations where we're getting mutual defection. Defection is inefficient, and so if we can resolve defection, these inefficient outcomes, by having cooperative strategies recurring through time in a repeated prisoner's dilemma, in a repeated games framework, well, that might be a way to avoid that inefficiency and move ourselves into a world that is efficient. But if the answer to that first question is yes, we have a follow-up question to that. How many stages are necessary? We know that we can't get cooperation to work in a one-shot game. Can it work in a two-shot game? Three stages? Five stages? A hundred stages? How many stages do we need to be able to achieve cooperation? That's what we're addressing right now. So let's go to the model. The model is simple. We have two players playing a simultaneous move prisoner's dilemma in each and every stage. After every stage, all information about the moves from previous stages is revealed. So in stage one, we choose whether to cooperate or defect, and then before we move in stage two, we know what the other person has done to us before. For the purposes of us solving this, we're going to start simple. We're going to think about what happens in a game with two total stages, and we'll go from there. Just so we're on the same page, this is a prisoner's dilemma. As it turns out, we don't need to have specific payoffs in order to be able to solve these repeated prisoner's dilemmas of finite length. But we're going to be working with this later on in this unit as well when we get to games of infinite length. So there it is for your reference. Let's go ahead and solve this game with just two periods, though. How do we do that? Well, it's just like before. When we're looking at subgame perfect equilibria, the best way of going about that is to work backward. We start with stage 2, and therefore move to stage 1. Well, what's going to happen in stage 2? We actually have another theorem for that. You might recall again from our unit on extensive form games that in the final subgame of a game with stages, players must play a Nash equilibrium in all subgame perfect equilibria. Let's think about why that's the case. If you're forgetting about this, you can go back to the video on that in the unit on extensive form games. But as quick review, if we're in the final stage of a game, so we're playing a bunch of games over again, over and over and over again, and we finally get to the last one, everything that has happened before is locked in. We've already accumulated payoffs from all of the previous stages of the game, so we can't change those. We can only maximize our payoffs for the final period. And the way we do that in these strategically interdependent environments is to play Nash Equilibria. 
if we're playing in Ash Equilibrium, I'm doing the best I can given what you're doing, and you're doing it the best you can give it one, given what I'm doing. So Nash Equilibria are, are the only sets of strategies that maximize these payoffs for the final period. So that's why in a final stage of a game, players must be playing in Nash Equilibrium. Well, in A Prisoner's Dilemma, we know that there is a single unique equilibrium, a Nash Equilibrium in the stage game, and that's Mutual Defection. So it must be the case in the second stage that both players defect. That comes t entirely from that theorem. All right. We know what happens in stage 2, what happens in stage 1. Unfortunately, the news here is bad. Actions in stage 1 can't affect future play. Regardless of what happens in stage 1, whether I cooperate with you or I defect on you, I can't change what we're going to be doing in the second stage. In that last stage, we need to be maximizing, and the only way we can do that is by defecting. So even if I cooperate today, you're going to defect on me tomorrow. I have no incentive to try to sway you for the second stage. I can't do it. It's not possible. So as a result, I need to be maximizing for stage one. I can't change my payoff for stage two. It's locked in. It's going to happen. We're both going to defect. So the best I can do for myself is to maximize my payoff for stage one. But the way I go about doing that, and this is the same thing for you as well, if we're thinking about the other player, is to defect. So that means that the result of a two-stage prisoner's dilemma is mutual defection in each stage. We can't get cooperation to work when we repeat the prisoner's dilemma only twice. Can we solve this problem by adding more periods, perhaps? Well, let's look at what happens with three periods. As before, we should work backward. We should start with stage three. Stage three is the final stage of the game, so we know from our theorem what happens. Both players defect. Let's move up a step. What happens in stage two? Well, similar to our stage one from our previous game, actions here can't affect future play. Whatever is going to happen in stage two is not going to affect what happens in stage three. Stage three is going to be mutual defection. So if we can't affect what's going to happen in stage three, in stage two, we need to be maximizing our payoffs for this one particular stage, contingent on the opponent's strategy. The only way we can do that, of course, is by mutually defecting. So we get mutual defection in stage two as well. And of course, this logic applies equally to stage one. Whatever is happening in stage one can't affect future play. In stage two, both parties are going to defect because in stage three, both parties are going to defect. So that means that the players must be maximizing for this first stage. And the only way they can do that, of course, is by mutually defecting. So in a three period prisoner's dilemma, we cannot get cooperation to work. This is looking pretty bad, because the more stages we accumulate, the more inefficiency we're getting. But maybe this is because we're still only looking at three periods. What happens if we have a really long game, maybe of n periods? Let's figure this out. We can work backward here as well. What happens in stage n? All right, well, stage n is the final stage of the game, and so both parties are going to defect. In the previous stage, we can't change what's going to happen in the future, so we have to defect. In the stage before that, because in all future stages, both parties are going to be defecting and there's no changing that, we have to be maximizing for that stage, so that requires mutual defection, and that goes all the way up. It's almost like infinite regress, except we're bounded by the finite length of the game. We're stuck with mutual defection. The fact that we're locked into mutual defection in the final stage poisons the well for all other previous stages. We can't get these cooperation contingent strategies to work. The result is simple. For all finitely repeated prisoner's dilemmas, mutual defection in every period is the unique subgame perfect equilibrium. There aren't any other equilibria there. It's just that single one. Now that's a bad way to go. And fortunately, we're going to see that that's not how we're going to end this unit on repeated games. We're going to have some good news later on. To overview the rest of this section, what happens when we have a infinitely repeated game? In this game, we only looked at what happened when there were end stages and there was some sort of fixed endpoint for the interaction. That's a little bit strange. It's kind of weird to have an arbitrary cutoff point. So what happens when we get infinite repetition of a game? What we're going to see is that cooperation is actually possible in these infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemmas, which is in stark contrast to what we saw with a finite length game. 
However, before we can actually get to these infinite length games, we have to go through some mechanics of repeated games. So that's what's going to be the focus of the next few videos. We're going to be dealing with infinite payoffs, trying to figure out how that works, and also trying to deal with the mechanics of arbitrarily large numbers of strategies and how we can cope with that. There's going to be a nice tool called the one-shot deviation principle, which is really going to help us out there. And then eventually we're going to be building toward what's known as the Folk Theorem in this unit. What we're going to see is that in these infinite length prisoner's dilemmas, not only can cooperation happen, but basically everything could happen. And that's a problem if we're social scientists and we're trying to explain phenomenon, because what's going to be happening again is that equilibria support just about every single possible pair of strategies for the players. And so, as a result, we predict everything. But if you're predicting everything, you're simultaneously predicting nothing. This is one of the most negative results in game theory and also in economics. It's called the Folk Theorem. We'll ultimately be talking about that way later on in this unit. So that wraps up the Repeated Prisoner's Dilemma, and I hope you enjoyed this. And I hope to see you next time when we start building toward the mechanics of these infinite-length games. Take care.